consider supporting TNV Gaming on Patreon.com for only a dollar a month. Link below in the description. Shout out to our first patron, Adreef. Thank you for your support. PlayStation is a story of success. Nearly all of their machines, from consoles to portables, have sold at least 80 million units or more, except for one, the PlayStation Vita. The PS Vita had a very hard life on the market. It never achieved anywhere near the level of success that its predecessor, the PSP, did. But why is that? What exactly went wrong with such a promising little piece of hardware? Surely, with Sony Interactive Entertainment's experience in manufacturing hardware and their Worldwide Studios' creative backing, this thing should have been a smash hit, giving the 3DS a run for its money in terms of pure competition. But sadly, none of that ever materialized, and the PS Vita faded into obscurity, finding a niche but devoted audience around the world. In 2004, Sony Computer Entertainment surprised the world with the announcement of their newest platform, the PlayStation Portable. It would go on sale that year in Japan with a worldwide rollout occurring the year after and would remain on sale until 2014. In that time frame, the PlayStation Portable sold over 82 million units between its four main revisions and its PSP Go variant, making it one of the greatest selling handhelds of all time and one of the first handhelds to greatly impact Nintendo's dominant market share. Naturally, after having a smash hit success, Sony Computer Entertainment wanted to take it one step further. In 2011, they announced their next portable PlayStation was in the works, and they were codenaming it NGP, or Next Generation Portable. The NGP was packed full of some of the latest and greatest technologies that the electronics giant could get its hands on. A 960x540p OLED 5-inch multi-touch sensitive screen, dual analog sticks which was a first for the console's time, a rear touch pad, a quad-core ARM Cortex-A9 CPU, 3G and Wi-Fi connectivity, six-axis accelerometers for motion sensing, GPS, front and rear cameras for augmented reality, and all of these features were accessible through the new graphical user interface now known as the Live Area OS. Needless to say, the NGP was a very powerful device. The gaming world was excited to see what Sony could bring to the table, especially with the likes of Uncharted Go and the Abyss being shown alongside along the console hardware. All of these games were not only well-known and well-received first-party Sony IPs, but all of them looked fantastic unlike anything the gaming world had seen on a portable device. But there was one catch. Sony Computer Entertainment announced that the NGP would be using proprietary flash memory cards with pricing available soon. Fast forward to the official 2011 launch date and the NGP received its official name, the PlayStation Vita, and it was the first Sony branded hardware to deviate from the standard numeric scheme that players had become accustomed to at this point. On launch day, Sony Computer Entertainment would announce that there were 25 games that would be available on launch day, 8 of which were from their worldwide studios, and 17 of them were from third party developers that were either exclusive to the portable or multi-platform games that could also be had on PlayStation 3 and other platforms at the time. The PlayStation Vita had one goal in mind, AAA console gaming on the go with social connectivity accessible via the PlayStation Network. And at launch, between the available apps and launch titles, it gave players a glimpse on what may be possible for not only for portable gaming, but on the PlayStation Vita. However, at the 11th hour, amongst all the excitement, Sony Computer Entertainment made a decision that would go on to haunt them for the rest of the console's future. They announced the proprietary memory card's prices. And this loan decision would turn away a lot of potential buyers, not only at launch, but for years to come. With a launch price of $249 US, the PlayStation Vita was certainly affordable, especially for its time. And the launch titles, while most of them were good, none of them were truly spectacular, with the exception being Uncharted Golden Abyss. And few of them were able to convince the general public that the PlayStation Vita was worth the initial $249 launch price plus the $2,200 that it would cost for them to get a memory card. From launch well into 2013, Sony Computer Entertainment was backing the system heavily with both first-party exclusive IPs and multi-platform titles that can be had on the PS3 and other platforms at the same time. But there was one area that was generally failing, and that was marketing. Think about the most memorable PS Vita related commercial that was shown on the internet or on TV somewhere. Can you? Probably not. And that's the big issue here. As a business, it's very difficult to sell a product when most of the general public or gaming community that you're trying to appeal to don't even know what the item is about or let alone that the item exists altogether. While the marketing was at best abysmal, software sales were beginning to slow. And that's because the hardware sales were slowing down even further. If no one has the hardware, they're not going to buy the software. And it's as simple as that. 
By this point, Sony sought to remedy the situation by introducing three new concepts that would attempt to unify the PS3, the PS Vita, and the PlayStation Network all together. And these three concepts included cross-buy, the ability for players to play a PS3 game and get the PS Vita version included in the form of a digital download code, Crossplay, the ability for players to play online with others on both PS3 and PS Vita systems either together or simultaneously. And finally, the cross save feature, the ability for a user to save his or her game on his PS3 and pick up where he or she left off on the PS Vita system or vice versa and move it back and forth at a whim. And while a lot of these features were certainly firsts, especially for their time, hardly anybody knew that the PS3 and the PS Vita were both capable of this kind of interaction. And no one knew it was possible. So hardware sales continued to slow down and the software sales continued to slow as well. Sony responded to this, not by doubling down on the marketing, but instead by slashing the system's price from $249.99 down to $199.99. And while the memory cards followed as well, compared to standard microSD cards that were available on the market from competitors, the system's cards were still vastly overpriced, thus deterring more potential buyers from getting a PlayStation Vita. Between 2014 to 2016, in the US and PAL territories, the PS Vita began to fade into obscurity, as hardware sales got to the slowest point in the console's life cycle, and the retailers began to see the writing on the wall. So Sony needed to do something, and fast. By this time, the PlayStation 4 had become a smash hit amongst the gaming community at large, and that Sony came up with two viable options to attempt to reinvigorate interest in their struggling handheld platform. The first effort came in the form of a new app on Vita called Remote Play, and Sony tried selling the gaming audience that if they owned a PS4 and a PS Vita, you could remote play PS4 games anywhere in the world so long as both devices were connected to Wi-Fi networks with sufficient upload and download speeds. Basically, the PS4 does all the heavy lifting in terms of processing and calculations and then streams the audio and video signal over to the PlayStation Vita system, thus taking the place of the player's DualShock 4. Now, because the PS Vita system is missing the L2, R2, L3, and R3 buttons, players would then have to utilize the front and back touchpads to make up for the missing buttons. Though some developers would actually take the time and program special remote play configurations for the button mapping, that way it would feel far more streamlined for players playing PS4 games through a PlayStation Vita system. So what was the message? The PS Vita was now the ultimate companion device for the PlayStation 4, and they slowly began to back away from it being touted as its own individual platform. The problem was that the PS Vita system itself still cost almost $200 to get, and for most of the gaming community, $200 for a Vita plus $400 for a PlayStation 4, not counting any games or memory cards, just wasn't a viable option for a companion device. The second bit of effort came in the form of the PlayStation Vita TV, or as it was known in the US and PAL territories as the PlayStation TV. This was essentially a PlayStation Vita system without the screen, designed for players to play PS Vita games on the big screen using a DualShock 3 or DualShock 4 controller. On paper, the PlayStation TV sounds like a fantastic idea, being able to take your already existing PlayStation Vita library and play them on the big screen with a DualShock 3 or DualShock 4 controller. However, in reality, the system was released half-baked at best, as a large portion of some of the PS Vita's greatest games were whitelisted as incompatible because Sony never patched the system or the games to utilize the DualShock 4 to replace the missing touch interfaces, and the lack of cameras just permanently bricked some games from ever working on the PlayStation TV system. In addition, since the PlayStation TV was competing with the likes of the Roku TV, Apple TV, and other small multimedia boxes, you'd expect them to have multimedia apps like Netflix, Hulu, Vudu, YouTube, Crunchyroll, and others, right? Well, it did. The problem was is that nearly all of them were whitelisted as incompatible with the system for unknown reasons. And considering that the system had a max output resolution of 1080i, in an era where 1080p TVs were the standard and 4K TVs were slowly approaching the market as mainstream, this system was clearly not built with the future in mind. So what was the end result? 
absolutely no one bought the system. And since Sony of America and Europe decided to drop the PS Vita branding from this system, it showed how little faith they had in the PS Vita as a brand and a platform. And to make matters worse, it only confused the market, as few people even know what this little box did. Some of them thought it was just a Roku TV or an Apple TV competitor. Others thought it was designed for PlayStation Now. But the reality was, was it could do all of that and play PlayStation Vita games through the top cartridge port. But because of Sony's piss poor marketing, no one knew. On top of an identity crisis, the PS Vita TV or PlayStation TV, whichever name you want to call it, also used the same overpriced proprietary memory cards that the original PlayStation Vita system did instead of going with either a built-in solid state or USB flash memory. And this did not resonate well with the handful of people that decided to buy these in any of the territories. To add insult to injury, barely a year and a half after the PlayStation TV had its original launch date worldwide, Sony Interactive Entertainment announced they would be terminating PlayStation TV sales worldwide. And what few updates this system got outside of security patches and a few handful of games that got patched to work with the system ceased, and the system was left a half-baked mess to those who were unfortunate enough to buy it. That is, until 2016 when hackers came along and found out a way to lift the whitelist, thus in theory making all PlayStation Vita games compatible with the system. To this day, a lot of PS TV owners, or PS Vita TV owners depending on what territory you live in, are waiting on hackers and programmers from the homebrew communities to develop code that will properly utilize the DualShock 4's front touchpad to take the place of the two touchpads that were found on the PS Vita system, thus in theory making more games available and compatible to owners of this particular micro console. However, there will never come a point where all the games will work, as some games like Uncharted Golden Abyss and Tearaway utilize the PS Vita's cameras. And since the PlayStation TV has no way for the players to plug in a PlayStation camera or even a PlayStation Eye camera, you can technically play the games up to a certain point, but when the game requires a camera, it will either just crash or brick the system entirely. By this point, what little effort Sony of America and Europe were giving the PS Vita had ceased, and retailers had saw the writing on the wall. So they began clearancing out all PS Vita related hardware and games simply to make more room for PS3 and PS4 games, thus sealing the system's fate, at least from a retail perspective, in the US in PAL regions. For the most part. While major retailers like Target, Walmart, and Best Buy clearanced out all of their PS Vita merchandise and made room for the better selling PS3 and PS4 merchandise, others like GameStop or EB Games depending on where you live, Amazon.com, and PlayAsia continue to sell PS Vita games and hardware. And it's through these three major online retailers that the PlayStation Vita's devoted and small audiences continue to get their fix for newly released PlayStation Vita games even to this day. By this time, a very strange phenomenon had occurred, and it's one that I've never experienced or witnessed in the interactive entertainment business up until this point. While the PS Vita died in the US and PAL regions from a retail perspective, in the Japan Asia territories the system began to sell and grow in terms of popularity. This phenomenon is one of a kind because as Sony Interactive Entertainment America and Europe did their absolute best to brush the PS Vita under the rug and pretend that the system never existed except for one point in PSX during 2016 with the Ease 8 announcement, Sony of Japan continued to market, support, and release new limited edition variants of the hardware. As this happened, third parties continued developing games that appeal to the players in the territories, thus moving units. Even to this day, amongst newer and far more powerful handheld hybrid launches, the PlayStation Vita is still being displayed on jp.playstation.com right alongside the PS4, the PS4 Pro, and even the PlayStation VR. Meanwhile, on the other territory's websites, you have to scroll through countless menus just to find a PS Vita page that hasn't been updated in years, or in the case of the EU PlayStation site, pages that have been removed entirely and can't be found unless you go through the internet archive machine. But I'm sure all of you have this one simple question. Why did PS Vita fail to begin with? While Sony's abysmal marketing was a heavy factor in what led to this handheld and micro console's demise, it wasn't the sole reason. 
As I mentioned, the PS Vita's proprietary memory cards deterred a lot of potential buyers and continue to do so to this day. But then we get to another question. Why did Sony decide to use proprietary memory cards to begin with? And why did they mark them up so high? And this is where we come to the core of the PlayStation Vita's problems. Because even with abysmal marketing through word of mouth, PlayStation Vita would have and could have sold far more units than it did if it wasn't for the proprietary cards. But to answer why Sony decided to go with proprietary memory instead of a more standard micro SDXC card format that was available at the market at the time, we have to travel further back in time, all the way back to 2005, shortly after the launch of PlayStation Portable. In 2005, barely one year after the launch of PlayStation Portable, hackers from around the world discovered exploits that allowed them to run unassigned and unofficial code on any PSP system running firmware 1.00 to 1.50. This would lead to multiple exploits, including the TIFF exploit, which allowed users to upgrade, or I guess I should say downgrade PSP firmwares back down to 1.50 to run unassigned and unofficial programs on the system. Shortly after hackers found a way to run custom software on any PSP system, the question soon came. Was it possible to run any PlayStation Portable game, a copied version, off the Memory Stick Pro Duo card itself, instead of running it off of the Universal Media Disk, or UMD? The answer, unfortunately, was yes. Now keep this in mind. All hardware manufacturers, Sony Interactive Entertainment included, manufacture and sell their hardware at a loss and depend on software to make up those losses. If Sony can't sell the software, they can't manufacture the hardware or make more games. If they can't sell games, they can't support the system. And in the end, the players, those who invested in the ecosystem, are the ones that end up getting hurt in the long run. For many people, especially in the United States, if they owned a PSP back in the day, they were more than likely running a jailbroken system with pirated or unlicensed software. And because of this, some, if not all of the people in the West that were using PlayStation Portables were downloading free ROMs of the systems and playing games illegally instead of actually going out and supporting the developers who invested the time, energy, manpower, and resources into creating these games for the PlayStation Portable. But that wasn't all. As Sony Computer Entertainment continued this game of cat and mouse, developers soon realized that the PSP's ecosystem was not secure at all, and that their hard work could end up being given away for free by pirates online, thus hurting their bottom line. So as the PSP got older, and as the years drove by on the market, more and more developers began withdrawing their support from the platform as they realized that Sony was losing the security battle to the hackers. So if you've been following the chain of events so far, it's plain as day that Sony Computer Entertainment wanted to prevent this same issue from happening again. But to do this, they would make a series of decisions that the players would ultimately dislike. Although, at the same time, it would allow them to drastically reduce or eliminate completely the amount of piracy that plagued the PSP and its ecosystem. The best solution that Sony came up with to eradicate piracy from the PlayStation Vita's ecosystem was to use a proprietary memory format that only Sony knew, and it would be far more difficult for third parties to decode and hack. They also realized that by tying the game's save data to the game data itself, it could in theory prevent pirates or cheaters from sharing the save data and cheating their way through the games in the same manner that they did on the PlayStation Portable. This is why the PS Vita can only have one account assigned to the system at a time, and that's why the PS Vita had a fixed battery as opposed to the removable ones that were found on the PSP. All of these decisions were consciously made to prevent and minimize the amount of exploits that were available to potentially deter hackers from jailbreaking the PlayStation Vita system. These decisions were not made just to prevent cheating and active piracy, but to reassure developers that PlayStation Vita would remain a safe space for them. And this remained the case for about five years into the system's life cycle until 2016 with the eventual release of Hinkaku. 
For almost five years, PlayStation Vita as a platform remained a safe space for developers to make games as Sony had the security down like Fort Knox, which was great for developers, but because they decided to mark up the prices of the proprietary memory cards, it didn't help because players weren't actively buying the system. The reason they decided to mark up the memory cards is because they wanted to use those as the scapegoat to make up for the losses from selling the hardware instead of relying purely on software as they've done in the past. I can't help but think that if Sony had competitively priced the memory cards compared to standard models on the market at the time, that players would not have minded having to buy a proprietary card so long as it was guaranteed to work with their system. On the flip side, developers would have had confidence in developing new titles for the PlayStation Vita system, knowing that the piracy and plague of issues that were rampant from the homebrew community had been completely eradicated this time around. Although all these issues had been solved, a whole crop of new ones had arisen as a result, as the PlayStation Vita, thanks to Sony's awful handling of the platform, never garnered any kind of audience outside in the West, and died from a retail perspective in less than five years after its launch, which is a major first for any Sony platform. So I think it's easy for people to see at this point that PlayStation Vita was designed to be a mighty successor to the PSP, but at the same time be the antithesis of everything the PlayStation Portable stood for, as Sony wanted to bring AAA console gaming on the go, social connectivity, streamlined access to the PlayStation Network, while at the same time eradicating piracy completely to assure developers that PlayStation Vita would be a safe platform to develop for. But because Sony Interactive Entertainment America and Europe never fully put their faith behind the platform, it died in both of those territories, but lives on in the Japan Asia regions. However, despite its failure in the West, third parties continue to localize and publish games here in the West through select retailers like GameStop and Amazon to satisfy the demand for PS Vita games here in the West. However, what we get here in the West is minuscule compared to the amount of games that are developed, published and released physically for the PlayStation Vita in the JP Asia regions. Seriously, take a trip to Japan and you'd be surprised on how many PS Vita games are on the store shelves in that territory. The PS Vita leaves behind an interesting legacy, to put it lightly. It's a legacy full of innovation, grand ideas, and broken dreams, as the PlayStation Vita never performed to the same levels that the PSP did, and to this day, remains Sony's worst selling platform to date out of their entire dynasty of systems. But whether or not we'll ever see a PS Vita and PSP successor, we'll have to wait and see, as I hope that one day Sony will release a handheld that can truly live up to the PlayStation name in the same way that the PlayStation 4 and PS4 Pro have. But until that day comes, I know that I will be enjoying my time here on Vita Island as there are tons of games that I own that I haven't played, plenty of games that are coming soon or are out now that I haven't gotten around to that piqued my interest, and I know that I'll be playing plenty of games for years to come on this system. And with remote play, it's my favorite handheld to date, personally. So. I would like to hear your comments about Sony's ambitious little handheld down there in the comments section, whether you own one now and love it, or you owned one a few years ago and hated it. I would still like to hear your thoughts down there in the comments section. Until next time, this is Tristan from TNB Gaming. I hope you enjoyed your time here as we took a trip back to the past about PS Vita. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Until then, take care. Station.